Hello, hello. It's uh, Tyler from Seven Fig here. With me, I got the ever charming Gabriel Ansel. Thank you, thank you. Not very charming, but I am forever. <laughs> we got. Uh, we actually haven't done one of these in a long time, man. We were actually thinking about doing a Q and A, and then someone we reached to a while back hit us up, and he's like, "Hey, man, think about the podcast." So we thought we'd bring him on. He's uh, in our industry. He's pretty. He's pretty well known by like the bigger dudes, not so much the smaller guys, but more the bigger guys in the space. Um, you know, Ryan yeah. Sabelli, I think initially maybe introduced me to you. Uh, I forget totally, um, but he does well. He's on a bunch of online businesses. I think what you do over 50 million a year in revenue. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Wow. And just absolutely crushes it. Crazy. So with that said, what was that game? I said crazy. Yeah, man. With that said, we want to bring on the one and only, the man, the myth, the legend, Joshua Keller. Welcome. Well, I want to thank you guys for having me on for sure. No yeah, problem, man. Absolutely. Man. Yeah, this is going to be cool too because we don't really have a lot of people that are big in the affiliate world. Mm. Um, we do a lot of e-com guys and stuff like that, but we get a lot of questions about affiliate stuff. So this will be uh, this will be a good window into that for everyone. So with that yeah. too, man, like uh, you know, obviously we've seen good success in e-com, but the majority where we made our money is all affiliate marketing. It's a great business model. It's the lowest yeah. overhead you could probably have in any type of business, and with the upside potential that's out there, it's like. You know, people get so over focused on e-com, e-com, but affiliate marketing is a great business, as I'm sure Josh is kind of going to go into. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. I went to uh, uh, Barcelona a couple weeks ago to that Affiliate World mm. conference, and every single person was only talking about e-com and only talking about Facebook, which I thought was really interesting. How, how like segmented the market has become, where everyone just gravitates towards one thing, and then. And then every, all the followers gravitate towards that thing too. Yeah. And, and you can tell, man, we find like when the gurus go through stages, like the whole market goes through that where like guys who have actually been in it, like, man, I, I'm in, I'm an email. I did email started 11 years ago, still mm -hmm. an email today. I've gone through different facets, but like there's staples, there's foundations that always, they're always there. You don't need to jump around because it's not like the old business model goes away. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I so. feel like there's going to be a big push on native too, because everything oh, yeah. runs in like in, in circles. Right. And I've been hearing a lot more guys that have talking about native lately too. Um, and I even, I don't know much about native, but it made me want to get into it and test it a little bit more just so I understand it more. So, but, uh, I bet you that'll be the next big push, you know, or YouTube videos. That's also another yeah. little thing. That I can see coming. And obviously yeah. we all know I called WhatsApp. So nobody cares about WhatsApp, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, um, it seems like most people are sleeping on native and they have a natural curiosity towards it but they don't know how to get started or they heard maybe a horror story or they tried and they lost a thousand dollars and then it just went oh native doesn't work but yeah from the affiliate world i mean the things that most people were talking about in an affiliate summit too as well was facebook e-commerce sms first party and um and push notifications mm. more than anything. Yeah, I've heard a lot about push. Yeah, we hey. we were just in New York for uh, ASE, and a few guys were talking a lot about push and how there's so much value in that list. Yeah. Well, it's kind of just um, and and we've done a little bit, but not too much on it. It's really smart for the people who are generating their own traffic because it just becomes another source to market them and retarget towards them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, they're almost not next to nothing. So. Then you have your email, you have your SMS, and you have your push and kind of triangulating them between them. Just beating them up on all angles. <laughs> Give me your money. So that, I guess until they say, I don't, I don't want your stuff anymore, Give me yeah. out. Yeah, that's true. It's very true. So how did you, uh, how did you get started? Let, like, let's go back and like, how did you get started into this industry? I started in the music business and somehow wound, wound up in uh, internet marketing. Makes sense. <laughs> I actually uh, started working for uh, record labels as A and R, and I was like, you know, the lowest man on the totem pole, just above an intern. Yeah, uh, making very little money in New York City, commuting into the city, just trying to figure out how I was going to make enough to, you know, the goal at that point was to to have a studio apartment in New York City was the measure of success when I was 22 years old. You know? So yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I quickly realized uh, I was going to have to get coffee and facts. Or, or do whatever I had to do in the music business. And then it was going to take another 10 to 15 years till I was the guy who was 
telling the intern and the assistant to do this or that. Um, I didn't really have the patience to make no money for the next 10 to 15 years. So I did that for about six months to a year and then quickly began looking for other opportunities. Uh, and what I landed on was pretty interesting. It was uh, a company called Music Vision and they had just raised about $20 million. Hmm. With a pretty interesting business model. This was- um, What year was this again? This is 2002. It's $20 million, uh, like 40 million these days. <laughs> Yeah, and, and 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 the internet was just, I mean, just. Oh man! So their premise was um, to go out and secure deals with this money, basically, to, with InSync and Backstreet Boys and Britney Spears and all the basically huge national brands that were doing these national tours, and they secured the rights to have meet and greets before the shows. So they would basically advertise online as a free contest to sign up to win a chance to meet these people. Then they would collect their email and all their information. And then they had a sales team that would then sell to advertisers on a CPM to market to those lists. So it was my first mm. introduction to not only the internet, but how to market on the internet. Um, and so it was a great idea. It was poorly executed and they spent through all the money and then basically went bankrupt. Damn. But um, so that was another great lesson. But I had actually um, left for the complete demise. And where I went to was actually a company called Synergy Six that was the second company ever to do co registration forms. So they had wow. a site called American Giveaways. Where they, Are they still around now or no? No. They, yeah. um, they unfortunately get, brokered out their offer to a bunch of other affiliate networks who then brokered out their offer to a bunch of shady people and then got wrapped up in brokering their offers to shady people situation. Damn. Internet marketers ruin everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the wrong ones, right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so, you know, it, but um, for me, it was an amazing lesson because from about 2003 to 2006, I saw a company doing, you know, tens of millions of dollars go to from that and like 60, 70 people to, you know, six or seven people just struggling to hang on to anything and wow. watch the whole the whole transition happened and, and there was a lot of what not to do mm -hmm. in that. And so that really led me to seeing the affiliate business from all aspects and then knowing that, you know what, I, I don't, I don't necessarily need or want a boss. Um, I need to figure out how to make this on my own. Yeah. Yeah. What, what would you say were some of the, uh, cause I always believe like knowing what not to do sometimes it's more important than knowing what to do. What were some of the big takeaways from knowing like what not to do? Um, you know, there comes a point in a business where you're not bringing in as much as you were, but you built a stable, you built a foundation based on the revenue you were doing. Mm. So a lot of what was happening was the company was still generating money, but their expenses were way too high for what they were now generating on this lower level. Because after they got in trouble, a lot of their advertisers and publishers kind of ran for the hills and didn't want to be associated with them. Sounds about um, right. So, you know, there was a lot of emotion tied into, you know, building, not me specifically, but the people that were owning the business, building a business and not wanting to kind of admit defeat or, um, you know, not, not wanting to let it all crumble. So instead, um, there was this constant hustle to keep it going, but then people would get frustrated with that, so they would leave anyway. So at a certain point, he would have been much better off to be like, okay, what are the five or 10 people I need to actually make this revenue? And everyone else has just got to go. I know it sucks. Yeah. But at a certain point, you know, um, another friend of mine uses the analogy of just like when you're in an airplane and it's going down and you need oxygen, you put your oxygen mask on yourself first before you can help anybody else. Yeah. So there wasn't a lot of that. I mean, that was one of the biggest takeaways. Um, it's just continuing to just do it for the sake of doing it instead of being the good business that you need at that time. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and businesses, like one thing I, I'm sure, like we all kind of know is businesses go through seasons. There's ups and downs, yeah. you know, all of a sudden the market you're in kind of falls, falls away, but then three years later it comes back. Like, you know, you just have your season. Yeah. I mean, I've had to adapt probably 16 times. Wow. <laughs> over yeah. The course of the years. I mean, um, <clears throat> you know, I started like, uh, I started as an affiliate manager and I was trading and brokering data. Then I was placing offers on co-reg paths. Then I was 
um, back to an affiliate manager. Then I became an emailer. Then I bought software to email. I mean, I, I you know, there's so many know. different trends. If I had stayed on one thing, I probably would be doing a different industry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you, man. Did you find those pivots got easier over the years and you're just like, you could transition much faster or is it kind of the same? No, what I think I've done as I've grown and had more revenue to play with is that I let the thing be what it is. So instead of like it being my everything, I try to maximize it as much as possible while starting new things. So gotcha. at the end of the day, I don't, I don't give up on anything. It just becomes um, down, like downshifted. Gotcha. gotcha. That makes sense. Because email specifically, I mean, it goes through so many ups and downs. Yeah. It's hard to build, you know, a stable foundation on that. So if you, <laughs> if you're doing X amount of revenue, you know, then you start to hire up to, to facilitate all that. And then you go down by 50% or 80%. You, you can't just keep that going. You need to kind of play the middle. Um, and if you have enough things playing the middle, eventually that starts to add up into a lot of things. Yeah, no, I've definitely experienced that personally, man. Even like uh, trying to move money from the online world into things like real estate, you know, just because, you know, it's great to know that you have a few hundred grand of equity if you ever need to sell a place or whatever you need to do. But, uh, you know, one thing we should ask you, man, do you want to kind of explain what it is that you do now just so people can understand? Sure. Um, so I'm a, I'm a partner in a, sorry, it's a, it's a long story. I know. <laughs> in a venture capital company that basically invests in our own internal products and then staffs them up. So um, I own a company called Union Square Media that's owned by the holding company. And out of that company has come um, two other companies. One is an email distribution company that has its own proprietary software. And another is called Maximus, which is an automated native media buyer. Both of these things came from within Union Square Media and then were funded by the holding company. So mm -hmm. um, without getting too overly complex, um, there's three pillars of revenue that we concentrate on. One's media buying, the other is network business, and the other is owned and operated sites that we make, which are lead generation sites. Our biggest one being auto insurance. Um, and then we have another one coming up pretty soon uh, in the solar market. Nice. We actually built software <clears throat> um, to start launching lead generation sites very easily that we can then distribute on our network and through our internal media buying. Operation. Nice. So you're kind of just feeding your own machines in a lot of respects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Cause the lifeblood of any network is exclusive offers. I mean, the worst thing that you can do, even if you have great affiliate managers is pushing the same thing that everyone else is pushing at the same exact price. Yeah. Um, that just becomes a terrible business model. So, what we're trying to do is um, have exclusive offers and create our own data to then remarket to them on our first part. Nice. That's awesome. And essentially just like for, you know, people who come from the e-commerce e world, you know, essentially maybe Josh might have a car insurance offer where every time you send him a lead, maybe he pays you 10 bucks. Uh, maybe your traffic's real good. Maybe he gives you 12, uh, whatever it is. But uh, that's essentially lead generation. And then you're out there selling that lead to insurance companies who then call them you know, do whatever and try to turn that lead into a buyer, right? Exactly. And then we're taking, now they're a member of auto savings. So we're then emailing them. Uh, we could obviously SMS and push, but we don't currently want to hit them over the head too hard. We're trying to uh, keep the quality of the data. Then we remarket to them for things that we think people who are also interested in auto insurance might be interested. Chances are, if you own a car, you might <clears throat> own a house. You might want life insurance. You might want health insurance. Uh, so we're constantly trying to refine and optimize uh, the workflow of any customer. And this would work in e-commerce. It works in lead generation. I mean, any basic site that you're doing, um, you want to be able to remarket to the people that you, you have as customers. Absolutely. Get that lifetime value. Yeah. No, it makes sense. So you got the email component. You have the native, uh, what would you call it? Like, it's not really a platform. It's more like a, an ad buying tool. How would it's you define Maximus? And an ad tool. I mean, Maximus basically <clears throat> uh, takes the ability to run more campaigns than you ever could manually. It's hard to get into why it's good without understanding native in general, but mm -hmm. it 
turns basically one good media buyer into like five because gotcha. a lot of the things that you have to do manually, you don't have to do. You set rules based on um, certain parameters that you want to hit. If you are making more than 20% profit, you want to increase the budget by X. If you mm -hmm. are losing X amount of dollars, you might want to pause or change your bid. Uh, so there's all ways to not lose money and to scale when you are making money and to do that as efficiently as possible. Nice. That's cool. So Could then you have email, you have Maximus, and then you have the affiliate network, which I imagine is kind of like a bulk of everything. <clears throat> no. So um, within Union Square Media, we actually have a media buying team that I built up using Maximus. So oh, nice. Union Square Media is actually the biggest client of Maximus. So we have a 10 person media buying team that focuses about 80% of our revenue on native. <clears throat> so that's where um, the majority of the revenue comes. And then second would be the network. And then third would be the owned and operated offers. Gotcha. Do you guys only really do native in, in house or do you do Facebook also? We do Facebook and Google, but um, yeah. native is definitely like our claim to fame. Cool. We like that nobody's paying attention to it. Yeah. <laughs> Until this interview gets out, right? <laughs> uh, let's, let's talk about native, man, because like uh, I'll kind of share what I know, but I'm sure you could take this to a whole nother level. The guys I know who are in native, they love it because they're not dealing with the same problems you deal with Facebook, which are generally account bans and like crazy algorithms. Yeah. Yeah. So we definitely have never gotten our, any account ban on any network. Um, the, the challenge with them is more getting your ads approved. It's they will never like um, ban your account for trying to get a deal approved. They're basically giving you suggestions of what to change if you want it approved, and if not, just don't even bother. Type of mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, one of the reasons why we haven't gone so heavy into Facebook before we got um, a really good agency account was the whole account game of you know I'm traveling from New York to Miami and because I'm checking on a plane, my account gets banned, and then I can't even get it back, or I can't get it back for two weeks, and just all the trials and tribulations. And that's with White Hat. God, it, God. Yeah, man. Yeah, that lost income over two weeks is just ridiculous. Yeah, so there's a lot of stop and start. And, you know, I'd rather focus on something I can build um, than just being, you know, uh, just so willy-nilly between am I making money or not? Like, all of a sudden, you build it up to $10,000 a day or whatever it is, and then it just gets shut. You, you're starting yeah. over. Yeah. We actually had the experience, I think it was yesterday, um, we're selling like camping equipment, right? Yeah. And uh, for that campaign and uh, all our ads got what disapproved because they said they were weapons. Yeah. Cause we're selling weapons. And I was like, I'm There's not no selling weapons. a weapon, man. Like yeah. whatever. So it just but, like, it, you're basically starting from scratch and all those ads went to shit today. So I was like, fuck it. I just killed like a hundred ads and then had to redo it from start just because the algorithm just flagged some shit. Yeah. And, and she goes. as soon as we hit them up, they were like, okay, our mistake, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But still, we're still starting over. We're still going to lose money today. And so was that a 50 K account? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great account. We've had it for years. We've spent millions on it, mm -hmm. but like, it just doesn't matter, you know? Yeah. So that is definitely yeah. the downside to Facebook. Yeah. Unless you get an amazing rep. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a hard, you're swimming upstream. Yeah. And even we don't even have a rep, man. Like it's, it, we've <laughs> never had a rep and we've, we've done some pretty decent volume. I don't know. Maybe they hate me. I'm not sure, but I don't have a rep. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's crazy with us is we've always kind of spent on there, but <clears throat> because of uh, our auto insurance site and because of a couple other properties that we've been doing, um, somehow we, we got into a tier or, or a spend per day where uh, the rep contacted us and she's just been, like heaven sent like every time there's a problem we hit her up and she's like fixing it within you know 12 hours or less so wow, that's amazing. i've never had that experience before and i've been yeah. doing facebook for you know six seven years yeah, yeah that is crazy so if there's any reps watching this hit us up please <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh we'll double whatever josh is paying you yeah uh, yeah so now, let's go into native because with native you don't have those issues yeah so native um it's broken down into a couple of things. People either are doing three things, cost plus model where you're going out to an advertiser and you're saying, Hey, I'll spend $10,000. You got to pay me 20% over what you spend. They're going to an advertiser and saying, Hey, give me the best possible CPA price you can give me. And then I'm buying on a cost per click, just like I might do in Facebook depends on which 
you know, bidding strategy I'm taking, but here I'm paying 50 cents a click, they're paying $60, I gotta, you know, get X amount of clicks and convert an X amount of dollars. Yeah, and then the other so one maybe is you'll content. spend $30 on clicks to make $60 in revenue. Yeah, yeah that would be a good, that'd be good. That'd yeah. be a good day, right? Great day. And then the other one is content arbitrage, which was really what people know native for. They, you know, it's also been called content marketing. Um, where they, you'll, I'm sure you've seen the ads, you know, 29 things that Pamela Anderson used to wear or whatever. And yeah. then I click on that stuff all day and I know better. <laughs> well, a lot of people do. Um, we don't do any of that. Um, but there are some people that are doing that very successfully. Mm-hmm. Um, that was really big, let's say two or three years ago. And then when the fake news thing came out with the elections, they really clamped down on that. So it really only left the major players in that. Luckily, we never um, invested heavily in that, so we didn't have to pivot when that happened. Nice. It's always been from our email day as a performance shop, so we'd rather take the, the risk, and so it gives us a lot of flexibility because we're not beholden to the advertiser because we took their money. It's either your offer works or it doesn't. If you want to pay this, great. If you don't, you know, we're moving on. Yeah. Um, so, and native is amazing because most of the traffic actually comes or majority of the traffic comes from premium news sites. So you have 40 plus people who want to read the news every day, um, which is a certain type of person yeah. uh, who wants to educate themselves, who wants to take the time to read about what's going on in the world. Um, so you have MSN, Fox News, CNN, hmm. Yahoo, AOL, AOL Huffington Post. I mean, these are amazing sites that if I told you, hey, you can put your product here and get right in front of their office for very, uh, offers only when they click on your ad, you pay, you know, that's a pretty easy sell to an advertiser. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. man. What about as far as like, you know, people, we love Facebook because it's Facebook, Instagram, it's so much volume. How, and you know, the sites you're mentioning too, obviously huge, Huffington Post, you know, Fox News, I'm sure is big, MSN, absolutely. Uh, how much traffic are you seeing on there? Um, I mean, this is not normal, but we've had, um, three days in which we generated a million dollars Wow! On, a, on, a, on not that many sites. Um, but in general, if you have a really good offer just on all MSN sites or just on, on Yahoo, you could do 30 to $50,000 in a day. That's you know? solid. Wow. So I think that that rivals anything that anyone's seeing on Facebook. I mean, I know there's guys claiming to do hundred grand a day or whatever this and that and the other thing. But um, it's not that it's one, it shouldn't be one or the other. It should be, you should have enough tools in place and a team in place if you're good enough to be doing Google, Facebook and native. It should yeah. be the third leg in the stool. Yeah. yeah, no, it makes sense, man. So you, you didn't always have a team, obviously. What was like, what was the pivotal point to, to growing like going from that like okay like maybe there's a couple guys in your office to being like okay now we can really expand was there any like learning lessons in that so many Uh, learning lessons but like (laughs) yeah so what were like kind of like the key points where you're just like oh wow like we should scale up and then be being like all right this is gonna work this is what we're gonna do to take this stuff to the next step because right now we're just like, I'm just a one man show over here on the advertising side. Tyler's got a team of um, email guys, but, and most people listening to this are, they don't have teams in place. So like, what was, what I'm getting at is like, if you could give advice for growing your team, uh, what would you say? Well, yeah, I think it's important to note, like in 2006, when I left that other company, um, and started consulting on my own. I did not have anyone and I was probably 40 or $50,000 in debt from hoping that thing was going to pay off and then not pay off or not getting paid everything I was promised to get paid. So it's not like I just like, you know, I didn't get funding. Yeah. I didn't, it wasn't inherit a ton of money. I started a business. I literally had no one. I built this from debt from scratch. Um, uh, but I think, you know, how I started was, okay, I have this thing that works. Let's say it's email. Yeah. And okay, it makes X amount of dollars a day. Let's say it's $500 a day. Um, I would get it to a point where everything about it was a formula. Like, okay, I know I got to do this and I got to do that and I got to do that. And I would break it down to a formula. And then I would say to myself, well, 
could I get somebody else and could I teach them and maybe they'll be 60, 70 or 80% as good as I will be, but then it'll free up 40 hours of my time mm. and only cost mm -hmm. me X. So let's say, let's say it's making $500 a day at a month. So that means it's $15,000 total, right? Yeah. So, um, and now I got to bring on a new guy and let's say a brand new person who's just out of college, but he's really smart. He's going to be anywhere from three to $5,000. So let's yeah. say it's 3,000 because yeah. you're in a, not a, not a city. Okay. So now I'm making 12,000. Well now what are my costs to make that 15,000? Let's say it's 6,000 or whatever, 7,000. So I still am making $5,000 profit and not having to do any of the work. Yeah. yeah. At that point, I could then look at, okay, maybe I can get five more of these guys doing it and scale it up that way. Maybe this will only ever be $500 a day, but I don't have to do the work now and I can find the next thing that's going to make $500 a day. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I still do this today. Like right now I'm in the process of doing something. I have almost a hundred people and every single time I've started something new, I've done every single job it takes to make that money. So I understand all that it takes. So then mm -hmm. I can then retrofit it to other people. I can't, you know, the last thing I'm going to do is, okay, uh, let's say there's push and, 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 and go find a guy who does push, pay him a ton of money and then not even know if he's doing a good job or what it takes to do a good job. Mm -hmm. but I think the most important lesson I learned was do every single job yourself only until the point that you learn it and then can teach it to someone else. And then if you can have somebody else do it, have somebody else do it. There's some jobs that just you will not be able to have somebody else do because you happen to be particularly good because of your life experiences and they don't have those. Yeah. There'll be some measurable percentage as good. So like I said, if you can get it up to 70, 80% as good, you're doing great. Yeah. And that person over time will hopefully get better. I mean, if you give them enough incentive, if they're young enough, adaptable enough, mm -hmm. if they come in and it's only 60, but you can get it up to 90. I mean, it's just more time that you have to think about the next thing or to be networking or bringing in bigger deals. Or let's say, you're doing mailing and it's $500 a day, but it's only because your data is not that good. Maybe you could be then using that time to go out and do new data yeah, yeah. Yep. Or, or whatever else, a new ESP that you didn't try, but you can be testing ESPs while he's doing the production. So, mm -hmm. um, you know what, man, I, I really like what you said about, um, just getting your hands dirty, knowing how shit actually works. I was going to say, not just thing, going man. hiring someone else yeah. because I agree with you, man, unless you understand how things work, like how, you, you don't know if someone's going to do a good job of it. And ideally, like the guy you bring in, if that's all he does, he should eventually get way better than you ever were. Exactly. That's all he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing that like doing it myself also has led me to building these tools like Maximus. Like mm. I would have never been able to build that if I didn't know what the pain points were of, of being that person. Like mm. I know better than anyone else how annoying native could be if you're doing it manually. And even if you're really good, you're only going to be doing certain things because you only have so much time in the day. I yeah. don't need, I don't need myself to be pressing that mouse when it's the same decision every time a computer mm -hmm. could do that. Yeah. But had I not had to go through the annoying part of, Oh my God, I'm out to dinner. And if I don't change this thing, I'm going to lose $2,000 by the time I get home at four in the morning. It makes a stressful dinner, man. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or if you made home at 4 a.m., that sounds like a long dinner too. <laughs> well, dinner turns into uh, whatever else. But yeah, uh, that's what happens out. in Miami. There's I want to go to dinner with Josh. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, so I've gone through every stage. You know, I've gone through being single, having a girlfriend, having a fiance, having a wife, having a kid. And so in each portion of your life, wherever you're doing, you're going to have things that you don't want to be distracted from just because you have to press a button that a computer could have pressed. Yeah, yeah I agree. That's um, cool. It's the same thing with a workflow. Like a workflow is just an automated version of a mailer. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, We're actually uh, building some tools right now internally on the mail side, just because uh, I wouldn't say like uh, I totally buy into everything Grant Cardone, but I like the methodology of like 10X, think 10X. And say if I have, you know, one mailer managing 10 lists a day, be like, shit, what can I do to make them manage 100 lists a day? What would that actually have to look like? And from there, like we're building some tools that I'm personally excited about that I think can already automate 90% of the reporting we get them to do. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've combined like automation. I also, you know, I have some amazing people actually overseas in India 
that um, are the most loyal, hardworking people, and they are like happy to do the tasks that normal Americans that I'm usually dealing with, not that they're above it, but they're not psyched to do it. Where as the people I have in India are like just thankful for the work. Yeah, yeah. We use a lot of Filipinos, man, and they're so grateful, so polite, and they will happily do anything, man. Like I, I'm, we're a strong believer in outsourcers for sure. Mm -hmm. I would say overall, we have more like people in the US and Canada versus, and that's for specific reasons, like just to be in touch with the culture over here, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because we used to have uh, one Filipino mailer and he would send emails to people talking about typhoons. Well, there wasn't any typhoons happening in America and our spam complaints rose because of it. Uh, But for other stuff, I hear you're saying, man, do you stick strictly to India when you're hiring outsourcers? Um, we're actually, we have some people in uh, the Ukraine, like a higher level tech people. Nice. In India, they're more um, offer builders, report reporters. Maybe there's some mailing aspects to it. It's, um, they tend to be hardworking people that um, we have doing repetitive tasks that need to be detail oriented and a lot of- More structured? Yeah. And- you know, they're just very good at following a specific way of doing things and not deviating from those things. And yeah. that's, that's really valuable in some positions and a weakness in others. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. No, that's cool. Yeah, we're, we actually, uh, for the, what I'm kind of building now, the, uh, they're Russian. Um, I don't know exactly where they're located, but they've been phenomenal, man. I wake up every morning and something new has been built. You know, it's great. Nice. That's awesome. It's, um, and so are they providing documentation and all that stuff or right now I kind of give them the overall vision, the functionality I need, and then they'll build something, then they'll send it back and I'll play with it. Maybe try to break it, you know, see what would make it better, show it to the team and then send them revisions. Nice. Ultimately I want to own the code, but what do you mean with like documentation? Well, just, uh, you know, we've had situations where, uh, you'd hire some pro it's almost like an interior designer. Like um, you hire an interior designer and then the next interior designer comes in and be like, this is all wrong. We got to change oh, this. Method, right. And so yeah. but if you don't have proper documentation, usually the next person just wants to scrap everything versus if everything's laid out for the next guy, maybe they can adjust it instead of like scrapping um, starting over. Yeah. That makes sense too, man. That way I'm not locked to these people long-term. Mm-hmm. Which you will be. That's smart. Yeah. That's good. Thank you, man. That's a good tip. No problem. Learn cool. from my lessons. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, right? <laughs> my mistakes. <laughs> um, That's awesome. Tyler, are you getting a Skype call over there? Yeah, sorry. I killed that one. What a That's guy. just come through. I was put on do not disturb. <laughs> What's that? Let's conference them in. Let's, see what they got Let's bring them in, right? <laughs> it's actually uh, every Wednesday right now, our team does a copy call where they review uh, top performing copies and they try to beat it every week. Nice. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Improve our ECPMs and grow, right? Yeah. So, All right. Let's get back to some questions, guys. Back to native. Yeah, so, so back to um, native. Definitely back to native. But just to recap on the, how do you go from being one man yeah. to having multiple people? It's really stabilizing that revenue and understanding what it is and then um, seeing who you can bring in for the lowest amount of cost hmm. uh, possible. Sorry. What up? Cat was yeah, just... I saw you bring your cat out of nowhere. Well, he was going to jump on the desk and it was going to make a big loud bang and stuff. So, No, that makes sense too, man, because you really do need to stabilize your cash flow or it gets pretty like pretty wild, man. I was going to ask you what, do you, what was your best hire you think that you've ever made? I've actually had a lot of great people working for me. It's still working. I have some people that have been working for me for nine years. Wow. So, uh, to me, like um, the average American right now, I think in a job, I think the stats are they stay on an average of one and a half to two years. Really? So, <clears throat> so every time we have somebody like last more than two years, we're kind of like, we're doing something right, right? Because we're doing yeah. average. Um but you know, I could not have done all that I'm doing without amazing people. It's just, it's just, there's no way impossible. Yeah. One of the biggest things, lessons I've had to learn is letting go, right? Like, cause when you are an entrepreneur, especially when you start out by yourself, hmm. you always feel like you're going to do it better than anyone else. Yeah. And maybe you would, if you were spending a hundred percent of your time on that, but to your point earlier, 
if you're not, somebody who is could be better. And, and really learning that lesson and giving in. And um, at a certain point, you're just trying to keep everyone on track. But some of my best hires was, you know, just keep people that could take some of my plates off, you know, because I constantly feel like I'm spinning plates, right? So the more yeah. plates you have, the less you're concentrating on any one thing. So um, I've had some great sales hires. I've had some great management hires, affiliate management hires, and especially with tech. I mean, <clears throat> um, my main tech person that I work with, uh, his name is Sean, you know, just to have somebody that I can trust and have shorthand with and to be able to say, okay, this is what I want to do. Now you basically take it and translate it to how other people, tech people can understand it instead of me having to, to, to take that load on. It's been That's so valuable, man. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. there, there definitely is like tech talk, you know? Oh, yeah. And what's great is he's been here probably more than five years and he started out at the lowest level of tech where he was actually part-time. Oh, and wow. just through the years, he worked hard and persevered and now he's running all basically every single thing that has to do with tech over Jeez. across all those companies. And now he's putting people in place just like I put him in place where, you know, there's a support system for him because again, he couldn't do everything either. So yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge to find the right people. And I've definitely gone through way more people than I've kept. Yeah. And it's kind of like mining for gold, you know? Yeah. Gold. Yeah. That's super cool, man. It's cool too to like, you know, if he came in initially part time, like you're kind of mentoring him on what it takes to put those people in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also teaching him how I look at things. So, cause I don't necessarily want a tech person to just look at it at, from a tech perspective, mm. the balance between what's good for the business and how a tech person would do things in an ideal world. Because a lot of times, you know, <clears throat> They don't want to change quickly. They want to like focus on a task and finish a task and then move on to the next task, which is a completely normal want and need in any job, right? You want to feel yeah. like I'm actually accomplishing something. You told me to do this and I did this. A lot of times halfway in between, it's like, yes, I know I told you to do this, but now we have to do this because this is going to impact the business way more than that. And yeah, yeah. kind of going through those trials and tribulations and getting used to that flow <clears throat> is uh, something that's learned. There's so much pivoting in this industry too. It's like one week you can be working on something. The next it's like, no, nope, drop that onto the next thing. Yeah. Never ending. It's like, what's, what's the point of keep working on something you know is not going to work anymore? Yeah. yeah, there is none at all. What about as far as like uh, letting go of people? Do you ever find that challenging at all? <clears throat> yeah, it's tough. I mean, the toughest one is when they're not that good at their job, but they're really nice people in general mm. and they're trying really hard. Yeah. Some of the toughest to let go, but, um, I've seen the gamut. I mean, some people I've given way more chances than I have other people just because I saw something there and then improved that. Right. Um, I generally think that I probably give people more chances than I should. Mm -hmm. And I say that sometimes it's worked out amazing and sometimes it's just it's like yeah. beating a dead horse, but Dude, man, I, I have the same, like the same thing. It's hard because you're basically affecting that person's family, their life. Yeah, their they, entire family. Everything. Yeah. Um, I was actually reading, uh, Warren Buffett was saying the same thing. He's like, you know, a lot of times I feel like I would have cut people earlier, but he's like, sometimes giving people the chance was the best thing I could have done. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, um, I had a guy just recently, literally last month, after a year of, kind of struggling with his buying. Um, he had a bunch of ancillary ta um, like skills, like he's good at video editing, good at creative, all these other things that weren't directly attributed to revenue, but his actual media buying, what I hired him for, we just could not find something to work. It just, yeah. for whatever reason we ever tried. And then last month, we just cracked the egg and all the money I had lost from the past year, we made up in one month. Wow. And if I had never like stuck, stuck it out, it. never yeah. had gotten there. And it actually happened with another guy six months ago. It took six months for him to turn around. And it was more about, in that particular case, learning what somebody can handle, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of times you, somebody comes in from interviews like, I can do this, that, and the other thing. You're like, okay, here, let's see you do it. And then they struggle. Whereas if you, I, I look at myself as like a coach on a basketball team. I can't have the center playing point guard. 
I have to pe put people in the position to have, be the most successful they can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times it's my fault. It's just as much as it's them not doing a good job of like, I'm, even though you said you could do this, I know you can't do it because I'm seeing you not be able to do it. So yeah. I need to give it you to put you in a place where you can be successful. And that more than anything has helped me um, is turn around people. That's a good takeaway, man. That's cool. You know, it's cool. A lot of people we talk to, um, well, who's the, I can't even think off the top of my head, man. But you're definitely one of the bigger, like, you know, the bigger teams we've talked to before. Mm -hmm. um, Joel was probably. Joel like, was big cool. too, yeah. Yeah, he, he had a big team. Um, Joel was an interesting one, man. He said his best year, he did $100 million in revenue. Actually, was a negative two net, two, lost $2 million at the end of the year. He said the money was coming so fast, he thought he was good. But when he looked at the books, he's like, I'm still kind of feeling that one, you know. Um, but it's cool to hear from someone with such a bigger business, like kind of talk about what they go through and how they even look at things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, so wait, from that guy, did he have like an accounting team or he was just doing all the books himself? I'm not even sure. Yeah. yeah. That'd be interesting to know, right? Was it like yeah. was he a bad accounting person or did he not think he needed one and just got caught? Turned around? I think he said he was more focused on just hitting that number, right? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. He was just so focused and money was flying in. He thought he was good. You know, do you, yeah. uh, do you get monthly P and L's and stuff like that? Oh yeah. Nice. I mean, every month, not only am I getting monthly P and L's, I'm sitting down and going through each one. Again, it goes back to, <clears throat> I have to understand everything that's going on and remake those decisions. Like maybe we signed up for a software six months ago that's charging us $1,900 a month. Yeah. And we haven't used it in 30 days. Like, do I yeah. really need that? Right. And if you don't go do the, do that process, it just keeps going on. You're just throwing money away. Yeah. And it happens in everything. Like how many ESPs you sign up for, for like the lowest, you know, thing, but then you don't touch it for six months. Well, you just made a thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, doing that discipline, I think is, is, is invaluable for me. I also, um, I also go over every single person's commission every month. Nice. Also still sign every IO that we do because wow. Because I'm not so granular with the day to day, it keeps me if I have to sign those deals, then I know the deals that are going on. If I have to pay those people commissions, I understand how much I'm paying them, right? Yeah, yeah. So I just even as busy as I am, I'm trying to keep a whole, like a pulse of the business so I don't just completely lose touch because then people are like well, that guy doesn't even know what we're doing anymore. Yeah, yeah. Fair. And plus, it sounds like it's your way of managing is just watching the money come in and out. Mm -hmm. It's the, Yeah, because at the end of the day, I mean, we can, you know, it's kind of why we're doing it, right? So oh, absolutely. Well pay attention to the most and people. in our industry, man, like especially with buying, like on email, we have each one of our mailers post their revenue yesterday. And I got a feel for each mailer. I know what they're sending. I know how much revenue they should do. So if they're higher, I want to know how come, what they did, so we can duplicate that. If they're lower... I want to fix whatever's broken. Exactly. Uh, yeah, but it's, you know, that's email where we're not, you know, you can make a 40X return on email. You're paying for an ESP. Where with your stuff where you're paying for traffic, um, probably like how many, how much do you spend some days on traffic? $100,000 is not like a weird thing to spend. Yeah, so it's like, it's Seriously. very easy for that to get out of hand. Yeah. Yes, that's why Maximus is crucial. I mean, I, I couldn't really even build a team of that many people and not have something like that because I would have no way to manage what's going on. Yeah. Will Maximus work for someone who's kind of a beginner into uh, native or is it someone who understands it and then just want, really wants to scale and build out? It's a great question. There is definitely... Um, it's definitely better for someone who's already doing it. Yeah. But if you're going to start native at all, um, there'd be no reason to not use it because it's going to be way easier than anything else. What it does is it combines the five biggest networks into one platform. So you basically can set up one campaign for all five. Mm -hmm. If you were doing it the manual way, you'd have to literally learn each one of those systems and they all have different tweaks. Like I kind of compare it to the difference of going from a PC to a Mac. Yeah. Both computers, but they work in completely different ways and you have to get used to it. Oh yeah. Access, you're just using that one format. So it takes out a bunch of the learning curve of native, but there's still a learning curve with anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The thing that I've found are people the reason why people aren't successful is 
they're doing Facebook or they're doing email or they're doing Google and that's their main thing. And then native is like number nine on their things to do list every day. And you're spending 15 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day. You're never going to get anywhere with anything. If you start an email for 15 minutes a day, you're not going to be pretty good. It's like, yeah, people aren't willing to like say, you know what? I believe in this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make All it work. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that's the biggest challenge. This just makes, it's just a better tool. It's, you know, it's a difference between, you know, if you were to any, anything that's, you know, between manual and automated, you're going to have an easier time. With well, I like the idea too, man, where it's like you can use one platform to manage five other platforms at once. Mm -hmm. Cause you can't, there's no such thing that will let you, that I'm aware of anyways, that lets you manage your Facebook and your Google and your YouTube ads in one place. Like that doesn't exist. But this is kind of sounds like something that will do something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And part of like how Maximus um, in the future will look is we're going to integrate all of those other. Oh, cool. Types of traffic. Into oh, that. nice. But for now, we see native as the biggest opportunity for us personally. And also the thing that's the most fragmented. So obviously Facebook has their own optimized pixel situation. That's really good. And Google does too. The native stuff doesn't have anything like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. That's, uh, that's cool. That's cool. Do you have a lot of Do you have a lot of users on that right now, or is it? So we just launched uh, the beginning of this year. There's yeah. about 25 paid users. Um, mm -hmm. So it's starting to grow. I mean, I've had to build a whole new company from the ground up. And, oh wow! Um, it's basically a SaaS company, which is. A I was going to say you're in SaaS now, my friend. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I've had to build. You know a separate tech team, a customer support team, a sales yeah. team, um, all from scratch. Um, so we finally have that in and now we're kind of telling the world that we exist. Yeah. Our main priority was, you know, keeping um, our internal buys growing mm -hmm. and we've grown exponentially. I, I always had maybe one or two buyers before I had this. And then now, like I said, we have 10 and wow. we're trying to hire as rapidly as humanly possible. Yeah. And it's just because now you have the leverage. Yeah. I have, I've, oh, I have, well, not only do I have the leverage, I can give you, even if you're on your own, you have a chance to probably make more money with me than you do on your own because you can scale so much faster and work so much less. If you're on your own, you're working nights and weekends or you're turning it off. Yeah. You're yeah. Not making money. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And also just to be able to manage that many people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what yeah. I think is really cool about it too, is it's a software you built for yourself. So you, you, you're not just a software company that's trying to sell it. You're a software company built for yourself. So you're, and I'm assuming you're always tweaking it based off what you guys are seeing in the marketplaces and what you're seeing uh, in terms of tools that you could use and other people could use also. Yeah. I mean, that's really where the majority of the value is. I mean, I would, the software wouldn't be any good if I didn't know what I was doing. And the reason I know what I'm doing is because I'm using it. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It's been amazing. It's like, even if Maximus didn't ever have one customer, there's so much value in it that it makes sense to keep doing. Well, how, uh, how long did you guys have it internally before you made it available for other users? Um, probably about six to 12 months. Nice. Cool. Um, and so we're super excited because uh, next month we're actually launching an app so you can actually manage the buys from the app. From the oh, that's app. cool. Perfect. Yeah. Well, what made you like want it? Because I know some guys like, again, we're building tools, but we're just, you're not going to be able to buy it just because it's going to be more specific to my wants and needs. What made you want to go out there and actually make it like publicly available for other people to use? It's a great question. I, um, I didn't start out doing that at all. I actually was building it for an internal team. Yeah. Um, it just became like, it's so ridiculous to do it the other way that I was like, there's no way I can't push this out here. There's other advertisers that I'll never be able to get like a Harry's razors or all these, they have big internal teams that are already doing buying tons of native. So I just said to myself, look, if I had, maybe if I had a hundred media buyers, I could cover all the verticals and I could cover all the networks and I could just grab all the money. But the chance that I'm able to find a hundred media buyers in a relatively short amount of time is very unlikely. So how can I also essentially make money from the same thing twice? Right. So, yeah, yeah. and not have to rely on that. So, you know, I don't, would I have started it just to service other clients? I don't know. I mean, 
the, the justification really was internal, but the, I just, it's, if, if you were already buying native and then saw what this thing does, your, your jaw would be on the floor. And That's so awesome. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to help other people be better at their buys while still trying to make money off it. Cause I wasn't going to make money off it cause they weren't going to let me have those buttons. Yeah. 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 That's, That's cool, cool, man. I like it. Where, um, if someone's interested in Maximus, where could they get more information about it? Uh, you can just go to MaximusDemo.com. Uh, nice. You can actually cool. schedule a live demo with one of the sales guys and they'll walk you through the whole system. Dope. We'll put a link below too in uh, the description of this. That does sound cool. Yeah. I think too, man, one thing that's going to separate, like, you know, I'd say in my opinion, the internet still has a lot of like the wild, wild west. There's still so much opportunity. It's ridiculous. More and more people are getting caught up every year. More and more countries, it's becoming more of like a standard thing. Um, so it's just growing. But eventually, you know, people are going to be whittled out. And I think the people that get pushed out are going to be people who don't leverage like automation and tools. And like, you know, I, I think about some of the tools, like I know what I'm looking to make or even what you mentioned. If you can have a tool replace five people, you've now also shrunk your overheads by four. That's right. You know, you're talking saving 20 grand, 240 grand a year. Mm-hmm. I'm sure before bonuses are even paid. Yeah. I mean, imagine so, like, so much leverage. Imagine in your email business, if the guys didn't ever have to push any buttons and all they did all day was think about subject lines and content and mm. all that creative, how much better their creative would be, how much yeah. more money you'd make by spending more time on that. Yeah. And that's I'm also, excited. <laughs> that's also a different kind of hire too, right? Because someone that's like, you could hire a more creative person than someone who is more tech related for that position and the software would handle the tech side of things. Totally. That's exactly where I'm going and that's where I think it is going is it becomes about who can come up with the best angle, not who can push these buttons by analyzing this data the fastest. Yeah, yeah. totally. And, and we know, like I know I've seen media campaigns blow up. Just It's not the, a different product. It was just pushed in a different way. It was marketed in a different way. And now everybody wants it. Like honestly, man, and I, maybe this is not the greatest example, but like the flashlight, the freaking flashlight came out of nowhere. Yeah. And all of a sudden it, it went from, you know, something you buy at Home Depot to like people doing networks doing millions of dollars a month through a freaking flashlight. It's crazy. It wasn't new at all. No. Yeah. I mean, um, it's, I mean, right now we're seeing that too with that cooling air thing. I don't know if you guys have mailed that or seen that, but yeah, yeah we actually, uh, we were looking at some like Facebook traffic on that. Yeah. It's going crazy right now. I mean, it, these, these, I mean, e-commerce is definitely here to stay. That's for sure. I mean, yeah. yeah, it seems to be what everyone is focusing on, whether it's dropship or having their own brand. Um, there's a big push for e-commerce right now. So question for you, cause you mentioned, you know, your affiliate summit world. Um, everyone was talking about Facebook e-commerce. Do you think the play still is in e-commerce or where are you kind of shifting? I'm, I'm more focused on evergreen lead generation that I know will never go away. Nobody, everyone's mm-hmm. always going to need auto insurance. Mm-hmm. They're always going to need, um, refi. They're, they're going to, I think that solar is a huge vertical. It's only going to get bigger. Um, I love e-commerce. My problem is my bandwidth. Like in order for me to do that, right. I'd want to go to China, make make you know, have a strong partnership there have yeah. really high quality products, have a brand that people can believe in. I don't really want to get caught up in the testing 40 products a day from drop shippers. And then when you get the product, it's absolute garbage. garbage. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would rather focus on these evergreens. I mean, like, you know, if you look at Everquote, their, their IP, they're, they're about to do an IPO, they're an auto insurance company. They only do auto insurance. Mostly they're wow. getting into other insurance. They're valued at five hundred million dollars. Jeez, a generation aggregator. That's all they. Yeah, have. it's like yeah, because all they're doing is, like you said, they're finding a bunch of affiliates out there, paying them ten dollars a lead, and then just reselling those leads. Right, and or buying five hundred million dollar business. Oh wow! Yeah, um, that's crazy. And that's just that's just auto insurance, right? There's all these others. I just met with a mortgage guy. He's a mortgage aggregator, and these guys are really good because they've been in the business for a long time. And they were actually mortgage brokers before they went into the mortgage lead business. Wow. They're doing five, six million dollars a month. Jeez. So these are like things that everyone like kind of was like, oh, that's old. Yeah, yeah. These guys are, are doing serious money. 
mm-hmm. on things that everyone's not looking at because they're all chasing that shiny, bright thing. Yeah. yeah. So I, I like I, how you said it too, man. Look what's evergreen. Look what's not changing. Yeah. And I'm not mad at e-commerce. I see like, you know, there's companies like Giddy Up and DFO that are doing an amazing job building really big businesses off of e-commerce and trying to do it the right way. Mm-hmm. I'm just not about that, like, kind of the guru getting into and then having like people don't know what they're doing do it and then there's like four thousand people doing it yeah they all fail and then it's just not good for the business right there should be like a little more thought Mm -hmm. sometimes i wonder um if they were teaching something else that was more sustainable would they have more success yeah Yeah. i also feel that Facebook and Shopify are going to put the hammer down on drop shipping because it, it's just not sustainable. And so many people are having bad experiences with it. Like a lot of people have slow ship times, but at the same time, some like some of the shadier people just aren't even sending shit to these customers, you know? And I, I think that right there is going to be pivotal. And Facebook's really like, no, nah, fuck you guys. Like we're done. I, I don't even know if it's like, I wouldn't say, cause there is, I think some solid like drop shipping that exists. I agree. But I think like, I, I hear what you're saying like, kind of like the gimmicky stuff, man. Like the stuff yeah. that kind of phases it out and people do well in that. And some people make a great model of just constantly cycling through stuff. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, what do you actually have? That's like a sellable asset. Mm-hmm. It was funny. It's like six months ago or 12 months ago that the big guru push was how to build a social media agency and get new <laughs> clients doing Facebook. Yeah. And now I'm all kind of shifted into the e-commerce. It seems like every year there's something new. Yeah. The problem was, is like for the people that are doing it right, you have all these other people who are doing it wrong, and then that's too much heat on this one thing. Yeah. Shut down. So it kind yeah, of yeah. For the people that are doing it. So I just know that like the barrier of entry to the lead generation stuff is not something a one-off guy could probably do. And if he yeah. did, he'd have to be pretty special. So for me, yeah, nobody can no nobody can ruin that. You know, it's like those are tried and true industries that existed well before the internet and will exist for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, it is interesting, man. Just to look at like staples like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even like lead generation for education, like schools, every time somebody signs up to a school, they make like, that's like 20,000, $30,000 that they're going to spend. So they're willing to pay a lot of money for those leads. And, oh yeah. Um, I'm a huge fan of that market. Love me some yeah. EDU. Yeah. Yeah. And what happened with that is like you had a bunch of scam artists like filling in dead people's information and then like mm. none of the schools basically wanted to, to do buy it anymore, right? So, yeah. so but um, that's actually having a resurgence right now because they kind of weeded out all those things and the tools for fraud have gotten so much better in the last five years. They really have, man. You know, that's one thing we're finding right now is just because like probably we're just heavy, heavy education, anyone that knows us. Um, we're starting to get a lot of like these schools, their budgets are only so big. And because we can conti- like continually send them like quality data, quality leads, we're just getting more and more allocation every month. Right. People are asking me like, Hey, how do you get this cap? I'm like, honestly, I'm getting all of it. Mm-hmm. Like you can't go anywhere and get it because they're yeah. giving it directly to me. Mm-hmm. And you really have to start slow with that stuff. They're never going to give a new person a oh, ton of cap. It's yeah. so painful, man. I and mean, that's a terrible business for them on the side because it literally takes them three months to tell whether the leads are good or not. Yeah. So somebody could be driving leads for three months and it could make them zero and they don't even know until those three months are over. Because yeah. we're, we're, we're working on some leads. stuff on the Facebook side and it's it takes a month to figure out if the leads quality get, is good or not. And then like it's it's interesting because it's such a fast industry, but it's also so slow on other aspects, you know, because it's yeah, to get that report back, be like, nah, your quality is shit or good, like in a month's mm-hmm. time. Like that's what you can do a lot of damage in a month. Oh yeah. And then the other thing too, we find it's like, uh, your quality shit after 30 days, but 60 days they come back, they're like, Hey, actually all this worked out really well. Can we get more? You <laughs> yeah. know? So sometimes you get that too. Yeah. Because they're literally sending packages in the mail, waiting for them to get the mail and then um and then calling them after X amount of time or hoping they call. It's just Yeah. They're yeah. basically buying new school way of getting leads and then using old school methods, <laughs> methods on the yeah. back end. We just need oh, our man. own call center. Right? Yeah. I'm sure Josh has one kicking around. <laughs> uh, I've never got into that because you need like so many people. It's just, that's a business I never wanted to touch. It's scary for me. Yeah, I hear you on that, man. Fair enough. We actually, uh, one of our data providers that we work closely with, 
uh, he's a call center for, he's got, um, I don't know how he gets, where he gets, but he gets like 50,000 leads a day that they're just like calling day in, day out. And uh, we email the data, it performs great. Wow. Are they, they calling like with a human or with like a robot, like a robot call? I think they have like a automated dialer, but they have someone like actually pick, like they have someone on the phone when they get a connected call. Oh, gotcha. So I think that's how they do calls. it. Yeah, man. Yeah. He actually, this guy, man, he sold his last call center. I think he had like 10,000 like people on the phone. It was crazy. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah man. It's like, yeah, it's I always think about like, who are those people that you're hiring and then who's managing those people, right? Yeah. Those are like, tend to be um, people that are kind of transient in their life. I mean, there's some people that are really good and, and, and get paid well. I mean, there's some call centers that pay like $100,000 a year for their call center people. Wow. Really? Volume. Yeah. Like when it's um, like a super high valued product mm, they have to yep. be educated on and sell. You can't necessarily have a guy reading off a script. He has to know the material, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, just the, the thought of hiring, how many people I'd have to hire to then staff up a hundred people in a call center and dealing with their schedules and all that stuff just always turn me off. But super impressive that somebody could build that. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely is. Agreed, agreed. Um, all right, let's see here. We're going to go off our good old questions here just to pivot the conversation. Uh, do you have any advice for people that are just getting into this, on the online marketing space? Be weary of uh, gurus, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, I mean, you know, I actually, I actually like – you know, I actually sent one of my guys to uh, a mastermind just last week. Mm -hmm. was, oh, which one? Uh, it was Tim Bird's mastermind. Oh, nice. Us. Yeah. Yeah. So he's a super generous guy. He has a bunch of different communities where they actually just answer questions for free for people. Mm -hmm. um, and he's done a tremendous job uh, with that stuff. I would, but, but obviously his ticket price is very expensive because there's a lot of valuable information. Yeah. Um, I would just say be weary of the people charging not a lot to teach you things that are super valuable, right? Yeah. Mm. Um, but yeah. besides all that, if I was just getting started, I think I would, like I did, attach myself to somebody who's having some kind of success, even if they're not paying me what I think I need or to live or what I think I deserve, just to soak up that knowledge in that game because there's no quicker way to learn. And if you are who you think you are and you can do this and that, what, what's a year or two to spend with that person to learn the right way to do things and the wrong way to do things. Yeah. It's, um, it's a paid education as far as I'm concerned. Honestly, man, I, I think that's great advice. Yeah. Just learn and like play the long game. Yeah. Like if you think about me, like I went, like I said, 40 or $50,000 into debt while working full time, more than 40 hours a week. Yeah. And you know, I feel like a lot of those lessons I learned are still serving me today. Oh, absolutely, man. It's like what got you here, you know? But if you do have something going on that's any kind of revenue at all, I would refer back to doing everything yourself, figuring out how much you can possibly make on your own, and then trying to find someone to bring in to help you so it frees up your time to grow that business. Makes yeah. sense. We, uh, that's we, cool, man. We interviewed a guy and he's just like, he's like, one person should be able to make a million dollars a month on their own. And he didn't hire anyone until he hit that number. And then pivoted and did that. So it's wow. it's that was my uh, that was Michael Lahat. Oh, did he? Yeah, I didn't even know that man. He said a million he dollar got, revenue he before it. he pivoted. Pardon? He uh, Josh. He did. He started an e-com store last year. Yeah. Never had a when he. I think he sold like odds and ends. Kind of. It wasn't his main thing, but he opened up a store last year. He did twenty million his first year. Yeah. Wow. On all Facebook. Yeah, All Facebook. Yeah. But he's got a very unique product that's patented and stuff. So, um, I'm yeah. not like downplaying his skills. Like he's a smart dude, but, uh, that product was definitely killer too. Yeah. He, did he, bought excellent the patent job. Or he, he invented it or he bought the patent. He partnered up with someone who had it. He yeah, basically, the guy I, was selling it out of the back of his car and making like a hundred grand a year. And Michael's okay. like, Hey man, I can throw this on the internet for you. Yeah. And how did he, he just, happen to come across that product organically yeah he just knew the they guy were buddies before i think and then he just tried it yeah that's a great story it yeah, is man it is. Michael, yeah. michael's cool i'm actually right now um i'm helping him find a new uh esp to use he's been hitting me up and i interviewed list track with him 
Um, we're looking at a couple other ones too, just to figure out like, you know, where the best place for him to go is. So he's have so he's just marketing to the buyers or are there partials on those too? Yeah. So what we want to do is we're looking for something with a abandonment cart with a, with a, what I, I want him to have is a unique short code as opposed to a shared where he can use that for all his abandonment carts. So it's kind of like transactional, you know, um, and then just great deliverability on the back end for his buyers list, you know, and his, mm-hmm. his type of product too. It's a type of product like people buy month after month. Yeah. What, so it's like, a cons- say what it is? no, I can't. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, um, he doesn't want someone to copy it or he would probably let me tell you, but, uh, I wouldn't want to yeah. like blast it out just for everyone, you know, just out of respect for him. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, later I'm dying to know. yeah. Yeah. No, he's yeah. got a great consumable product. Actually, um, everything he's always done has been on his own. He's been on Facebook. He, he's got a girl that's helping him with Google and stuff now, but I honestly think like putting on a proper network, man, would be a yeah. decent platform. Well, he also, has he, tried, he has, he tried, has he tried native? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean <laughs> I... Josh is like visually upset. I don't know. No, no, you know no, what else is going to be upset? <laughs> Ryan, once he hears yes. this, <laughs> yeah, because he, he wants that. Yeah, sure. Um, no, stuff. that's all good. Yeah, we got plenty of deals to work with, but um, you know, just for him in general, like just trying native or getting or partnering up with someone to do native. Generally, if it works on Facebook, it's going to work on native. Really? Hey, I was going to ask you, man. Is there ever products that don't translate well? Not from that. I mean, unless it's like, let's say something that's like super, super, super targeted and Facebook is working because of that targeting. Mm-hmm. That's really the only reason. But if somebody was like, here, I want you to run my offer. And then they showed me Facebook and how much they were doing. I would 100% try versus if they came to me and said, here, try my offer. Like that, that would be enough of a qualifier to get me very interested. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Hmm. We may actually, uh, one thing me and Gabe started, uh, working on, uh, was a funnel for our e-commerce store. Um, just so that we could, we want to figure out like lifetime value, you know, like how much can we pull out of it and add in upsells and all that stuff. And so far it's a $30 product right now. We're seeing an average order value of about 55 bucks. Um, and we haven't added in any sort of like, uh, anything on the email end yet. And we truly want to figure out what that, yeah, that number is as well as push it up on the front end. Yeah. yeah. From what I've heard from other people is like generally with these products that are all in that similar price point, you got to be paying affiliates somewhere between 28 and $35 and your average card value should be somewhere in the 70 to 90 range. So you're not that gotcha. far off. Interesting. Yeah. We're not far off, man. Cause you yeah. still got shipping. You got to buy the product. Yep. You got yeah. returns or whatever those are. You got merchants yeah. and processing. That was our um, first try too, which I'm pretty excited about. So I'm like, we've never really done, pivoted this way. So it's going to be cool to see what happens. Our, our, uh, our kind of big thought is if we can take, because right now Gabe's done an excellent job of running on Facebook, but it's only been on Facebook. Ideally, if we could get some other people run in who are experts at, you know, Google, native, whatever on a CPA. So we're not really taking risk and they're mm-hmm. seeing a good upside. Because I find like the best, like the best native guy, you're probably not going to be able to hire him. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he, he knows his worth. He wants to get paid a percentage. It's not like you're going to salary him, you know, uh, for the most part. Uh, but anyways, what we want to do ideally is try to take, put together some sort of offer, be able to put on a, like, you know, a network, maybe two, and then get more traffic streams rolling. And then we feel like we have way more desirable, like asset we can sell. Yeah. Yeah. So I can kind of, I can, after this, I can kind of share with you, like, what you need your conversion rates to kind of look at your APCs and um, generally what kind of flows seem to work and you can just take a look at that. But yeah, dude, that'd be uh, amazing. But uh, do you guys ever use a tool called VWO.com? We know of it. Yeah. I've used yeah. visual website optimizer once. Yeah. We don't really it's, use uh, it with Shopify or anything though. It's amazing. I mean, I don't know how well it integrates with Shopify, but We've seen on pre-sale pages, you know, two, 300% difference in click wow. just based on testing different variations on that. Mm-hmm. Damn. That's cool. So yeah. I don't know if you could integrate it with your, with your funnel, but if you could, I mean, that it'll probably, be- uh, where did we built the funnel on click funnel? So I'm sure it, it integrates with that. 
Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's all the difference, a different headline, an image, uh, the way you show the form are all the forms on one page. Is it over six different pages, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I really, that's uh, cool. Yeah. What have you seen? Art. Yeah. I was going to ask you, man, what have you seen as far as like conversion rate on the page? Some of like, it's like the, you know, the 80, 20, man, 20% of the things you do give you 80% of results. Where would you focus that 20% if you were looking to increase, you know, the amount of conversions on a page? VWO. I mean, <laughs> just, just, just to start with, just to be like, okay, I know this is the best headline. I know this is the best image. And then you can see how far you're off and try different things. Other things to be like the order of the upsells, right? Mm. How, you're, how, how aggressively you're going with the upsells. How, how, what's your price of your product? Like maybe you take down the initial price because you know that you're going to get more people through it and then have more upsells. Like there's so many different variations that you yeah. can go through. But, but first and foremost is getting the most people to get to the point where they're making the decision to buy it. Gotcha. Fair enough. So split testing headlines, call to action buttons, pictures, yeah. color yeah. schemes. Just right, so everything. like I was talking about, you know, content marketing and marketing angles being the future that includes that right because yeah in a lot of times in media buying and a little, sometimes an email they have pre-sales for offers so mm -hmm. the, the amount of people that click that pre-sale could determine whether an offer works or not yeah the drop off right so let's say you're emailing whatever a flashlight offer and let's say this is a year ago and they were still hot and uh <laughs> And Flashlight they, never goes away, friend. Never. That's true. You always need light in the dark, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Anyways. The light. Um, let's say they give you a pre sale. You shouldn't just assume that that pre sale is the best possible pre sale. What you should do is take that pre sale, host it on your own domain, and then put the VWO on that. And through every single click, do those variations. And you might mm. find one that clicks double the amount. Well, so instead of giving up on that offer, maybe it's now your best offer instead of offer number 12. Yeah. Oh, that's good advice, man. Yeah. All this stuff is applicable to Shopify too. Like nobody really messes with headlines, with images, with bigger oh, yeah. buttons. They just like toss it up and hope for the best. But uh, we've even or noticed copy, big pivots with that. Or copy everyone else, which works to a certain extent, but you're never going to see like the kind of margins you will if you're unique and creative. I mean, yeah. the best media buyers, and you know, Ryan from Advita is a great example. It's like, he goes so hard into creatives and angles and finding the best click through rate with the best pre sell. I mean, he's, he's a master at that. And I've seen, you know, that be the difference between success and failure a lot of times, but mm -hmm. um, I, can see I really that. think it's a lost art. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get Ryan on this podcast too, man. He's an interesting cat. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah, that's awesome, man. This has been fun. I think like we're we're past the 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 hour point here. I don't know exactly what we're at, but like we've oh been we've God. been having at it for a while. Yeah, I didn't even and honestly, that. this has been useful stuff for us to like yeah. apply to our business, man. So this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to. I just wanted to keep asking more questions, man, because you're at a way different level than like we are for sure. Well, maybe um, we can do part two in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, always. Always, always. It would be cool too, man. Do you have uh, actually on um, what's it? What's the software called again? Maximus. Maximus. Do you guys go through uh, campaign demos and stuff like real live campaigns when you uh, show people? We show them. We've basically made a, like a, a mock up of something that's very close to real without like disclosing the advertiser's information or anything like that. Gotcha. Cool. Basically, it, it's is it's it's been demo demo eyes right but like it's yeah. basically pretty real um but you can see how everything works and they actually take you through setting it up and, and doing all that stuff i mean i would just suggest anyone who's interested in native at all just get the demo to see what it's like to learn about native in general whether you decide to use it or not um maybe use it in a year from now but you kind of know what it's like and that sets you off into a different path yeah who would you say is like the ideal person to look at using native is it someone who's seen some success right now on Facebook? Um, is it like, like I imagine someone who's never has any experience, maybe this isn't the best thing for them or maybe I'm wrong. Um, it just depends on how hard and how dedicated they want to be. But in their, in their case, it would probably be better to work for someone who did it, learn it and then come use Maximus. Right. But yeah. Uh, yeah. in general, 
it's built for advertisers that want to control their own traffic and not have to rely on affiliates. Mm -hmm. These affiliates that are already generating money in media buying, whether it's Facebook, Google, or native, so they understand the principles of, I pay a click, I convert it into a CPA. And for agencies that are trying to build up their business, I'm trying to build a media buy team. So maybe it's a guy who has, there's a sales guy and a, and a media buying guy, and there are two or five people and they're trying to build up their agency. This is a really unique offering for them to go out to their advertisers and say, you know, we do native and we're great at native. You should give us our business because nobody's really pitching that. Yeah. Everybody, it's this thing that like everybody knows about it and they kind of want to try it, but they just don't know where to go or they don't know how to get started. So it's a great sell. You, you know, what's interesting too, man, uh, which you kind of uh, laid out for me here. I assumed that there'd be uh, the drop off between product stuff that works on Facebook to native would be huge. I thought native would be more limited. But if you're saying you're seeing way, like basically if it's working on Facebook, it has a very good shot, a very real shot of working on native. That opens up a, a lot more world and it gets you around the issues of like the Facebook bans or like you said, you, you travel and Facebook closes down your account. It's nice to have a place with consistency. It's a place that wants your money. Yeah, yeah. they love those products. And also um, the only caveat to that would be that I think that a plus 40 thing that would, would appeal to a plus 40 would have an even easier chance. So I think you wow. can make anyone that's working, but if it actually appeals to 40 and up, it's like, it, there's very little chance that it won't work. If it's wow. 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 That's cool. That's super good to know. Makes you want to yeah. rush it. And like if I, was, if I was doing Facebook and e-com and I wanted to diversify, I would be looking heavily into this because just like I'm spinning a bunch of different plates, it's a good plate to spin and having that as a backup, even if you're learning in the background, yeah, yeah. And like spending a hundred bucks a day for the next three months. I was going to ask you, what's your good little budget to start with? I would say, you know, when we do a new campaign, we're generally testing um, about two to three times the CPA on any given site or creative. So, but it'll be two to $300 in a day, but over the, over the lifetime, we're basically weeding out bad creatives Mm -hmm. And if anything spent more than two or three times CPA and it's not working, we, we cut it off. Yeah. Gotcha. Like, and would you take a working Facebook creative? Like say for the guys, cause I know there's a lot of people, we get all these Facebook questions. So I know we have a lot of people interested in Facebook. If someone's got a creative that's working on Facebook, was that the best place for them to start? Or would you get them to make three, four variations and test them all? I would 100% start out with the best um, image. And then I would probably come up with 10 different headline variations, try to find the best two or three headline measure variations, and then mm -hmm. try 10 different images with those variations. Gotcha. My, my understanding of native is you start broad and then you just keep cutting and cutting and cutting placements and images until you just have it dialed down. Is, is that correct? That, sort of. So that's yeah. what the rep would be. I'm no pro. Yeah. The rep would basically tell you that because they obviously don't want you to just spend on the 50 good sites that they actually have. Yeah. 10,000 that they represent. Uh, yeah. um, but in general, it's much easier if you focus on the things that have the most volume and the highest quality, like an AOL or an MSN or a Yahoo. Gotcha. Um, then once you have profit and you have it working, use that profit to then try to find the other secret sites that you probably wouldn't find if you didn't have the budget. So you're not, Dude, that's great advice. Money. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, because like, you know, a lot of people are not going to have, you know, five, 10, $15,000 just to lose, to find the good mm -hmm. sites and then make the money back. Yeah. So start with the, the simplest thing you can with the most amount of opportunity and then build from that. Yeah. Awesome. That's, that's super cool. good advice. Yeah. Cause you're right. Like a rep would be like, Oh yeah, let's just run everything and cut it from there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's better for them and that's what they tell them to pitch anyway so yeah uh, cool yeah damn well thank you very much yeah, Mr. Thanks, man. I appreciate it man that's fine guys looks thanks like for having we go out dinners on me <laughs> <laughs> at least at the first spot right yeah are you going to Miami <laughs> soon Tyler <laughs> I was actually uh, talking about going this weekend but yeah. uh, I'm not sure if it's going to happen yeah yeah well All let right. me know when you're coming down I definitely do yeah that. definitely man we're going to talk some email too yeah All right. later brother all right. Have a good one. Everyone, Bye. seven fake. Let us know. Let us know what you think if you like Keller.
Um, <laughs> you probably will. He's a pretty handsome man. And yeah. Uh, yeah, check out Maximus if you're interested in Native. Yeah, we'll put all the links and all that jazz in the description. And uh, yeah, peace. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye.